Hi everyone, my name is Mbali Williams. I'm currently a student at UCT. I'm born and bred in Cape Town and the person that I will be discussing today will be the late Professor Benjamin Tirak. Thank you Mbali. Lydian? Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lydian Plykis. I'm 19 years old. I'm currently studying at UCT, um, doing a BA in theater and performance. And today I'll be speaking about um, Sophia de Brain. Thank you, Lydian. Neil? Good morning, everyone. My name is Neo Kumete. Uh, I am 19 years old. I'm currently a theater student at UCT. And um, I am. I was born in Belito, KZN, and I will be discussing Geraldine Fraser Monacchetti. Thank you, Neo. Oliver? Good morning, everyone. I'm Oliver Wood. I'm 18 years old. I am currently studying at UCT for a BCom degree in financial accounting. And I'll be speaking about Professor Ben Turok. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver Putti. Good morning, everyone. My name is studying a bachelor's degree in theater and performance, born and bred in Johannesburg South. And my interview, the interview that I watched was Sophia de Bray, and I'll be discussing her leadership skills. Okay, thank you and welcome to all our panelists. Um, we're gonna get right into the discussion. So I'm going to ask everyone to please touch on what they felt was um, sort of the key issue that resonated with them from the episode that they watched. Um, we'll begin again with Ayanda, please. Okay, so um, I think for me to keep it quite simple, the three main kind of lessons that I took away from Geraldine's interview was that a good leader is always selfless, passionate, and is never silent, to quote her. Um, I think in terms of selflessness, this comes through when a leader is always willing to put um, the interests of individuals of the nation above their own. Um, they are always conscious of the fact that their commitment um, transcends just themselves and their own interests. And they are always thinking of other people when they speak, what they do in their actions, with the decisions they make. They always have the interests of other people at heart. And I think secondly, the passion is then what drives the will to be selfless. Um, the passion and the compassion one feels for serving other people and for um, making sure that everyone around you is best off. That passion is what drives the willingness to be selfless. And lastly, as I mentioned earlier, to never be silent, to never be complicit in times of wrongdoing, to never be um, complicit in times of injustice, that is super important as well, to always speak up and represent for those whose voices are silenced. Thank you so much, Ayanda. I think passion is really such an important thing when it comes to being a good leader. Um, I'm going to now ask um, Lydian if she will touch on the key lesson. Um, what I found very um, important after watching Sophia DeBrain's interview is um, something so simple and something that I think has been taken for granted um, when searching for a good leader or wanting to be a good leader is this is just genuine compassion um, for the people that need help to say what they need to say or people who cannot fight for what they what they um, believe in because they don't have the resources or they won't be able to um, yeah um, but just genuine compassion um, for the underdog. And this is not in to feel sorry or to um, speak um, above them or to take the position of their um, problems, but to highlight and to make a difference um, with just genuine kindness, genuine compassion in one's heart. Yes. Thank you so much for that contribution, Lydian. I'm now Austin Bali to share with us. My biggest takeaway from um, Professor Turok's 
interview was that you need to, as a servant leader, dedicate yourself to the national interest because running a state democratically and efficiently means by driving the interests of your people and what's best serving to your people and not your own personal interest. And even if that does mean facing criticism from the people that you align yourself with or the, the job that you signed up for, um, taking accountability truly to, to run a state the way like best desired and best serves the population. Thank you Mbali, I'll now ask Neo to contribute. Um, so after watching uh, Geraldine Fraser Moloketi's interview, I thought a lot of things were really um, interesting and really rooted in stuff that we can take into today's society as young people. I think what I took away the most was her courage and how she displayed that in so many different forms. At such a young age, she was so unapologetic about fighting for social injustice and just so dedicated to what she was fighting for. Um, she goes into various instances where she um, was put in solitary confinement and just then again showed unwavering loyalty. So I feel like courage is one of the biggest things that I took away from watching her interview and how courage itself isn't necessarily the absence of fear, but just the pursuit of that um, higher issue, a bigger goal with the acknowledgement that you are afraid or that things could go sideways, but still the pursuit of that goal was so inspiring to watch. Thank you so much, Nea, for that contribution. I'll now ask Oliver to um, present the key um, insights that he found from um, the interview that he watched. Um, from watching Ben Turok's interview, I learned that one should always stick to one's principles and beliefs because it enables you to form your own identity. And that's what today is about, Freedom Day, the freedom of all people. And it helps you establish a connection with various people and values which you truly believe in. And that enables you then again to achieve great achievements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oliver. Um, so last but not least, Puti, we will please um, contribute on to that um, agenda point. Well, the key lesson that I learned from watching Sophia de Brain's interview was to refrain from sweeping things under the carpet. We should stop concealing and hiding things regarded as unlawful within the context of the history and deeds of South Africa. We need to speak truth and say it like it is. Be open about it and find a way to repair what has been broken or deconstructed. Um, sweeping it away could only damage the country in the long run. And do not keep information enclosed from the public as it could find its way and has a huge impact in the future. Thank you so much. So I've gotten a lot of key words um, from what you've all mentioned. So it's courage, compassion, and passion, working towards a national interest, sticking to your principles to form an identity and being honest about the real facts, right? So those are some key ideas that carry through from the messages that you've all shared. So now to move on to what you think the overall message is of the episode that you watched and what you think um, the interviewee was trying to convey. Um, for this, I'm going to begin with Puti, if you can please lead the discussion, thank you. So in the interview, Sophia is trying to, what it, Sophia is trying to say about women's rights and social justice is that women and their rights are often pushed aside, ignored, marginalized, and overlooked. For example, the women in the rural areas are clueless about gender and the way they should be treated. This is deeply rooted in the patriarchal system of apartheid that stripped them off of freedom and tranquility. Having to march to the Pretoria building in August 9, 1956, alongside 20,000 other women from different racial backgrounds, mm -hmm. as their issues have always been at the base of the pipe. In the present times, women in the MP are fixated and distracted on fashion and glamour instead of facing the real issue at hand, and in a way, sort of letting women of SA down. 
Thank you, Puti. That's very, very powerful. I'll now ask um, Neo to just touch on um, the message from the interview that she watched. Um, so in the interview that I watched, I thought um, there were a couple message takeaways that she offered. Um, a very interesting one was that she talked about how she was part of three different um, leadership organizations at the time and committees. And in the interview, she was actually asked if that um, was difficult for her, um, that duality of membership, if that kind of posed issues. And I thought that was so interesting even looking into today's society. So often we feel like we can only be part of one activist group or we have to dedicate our whole belief system to only one form of activism, whether it be gender-based violence or environmentalism or whatever. But her kind of talking about how you can incorporate all those things, you don't have to be one dimensional type of activist. It, it's more a plus than, um, something that should hold you back in your leadership. I also thought it was interesting um, how she touched on social and economic justice as well. Um, she talks about breaking down the patriarchy one step at a time. And I think so often women feel like it is only their fight in breaking down the patriarchy and how they have to engineer and pioneer this whole um, movement in order to get a seat at the table. And she talks about the fact that men, our male counterparts, our male allies as well, need to kind of join females in this fight. And that's the only way we'll get to a progressive South Africa. That's the only way we'll um, actually see change if men and women work, work together to break down the patriarchy. So I thought those were two interesting points from her interview. Thank you so much, Neo. I'm gonna ask Ayanda just to touch on some of the things that you picked up on um, in your contribution. I actually fully agree with Neo, and that was one of the things that I took away as well from the interview was the intersectional approach that Geraldine used within her own activist work. And in addition to just non-racialism and non-sexism, she also considered the plays of classism and how that affected people as well. And I think that intersectional approach is another quality that I think is so important in leaders because if you are serving a population, you need to understand that within that population, there's a vast number of identities and the way we exist in the world determines how we are perceived, how we are treated, which systems of oppression we benefit from or which ones we are oppressed by. And in order to serve um, equally and inclusively, you need to understand those identities and how to approach them and how to deal with them in the different ways that they need to be dealt with. So I think that was something that I also really resonated with and something that I like to include in my own activism. So that would be one of the biggest takeaways for me as well. Thank you so much, Ayanda. Um, Lenina will also ask you if you can just contribute um, to that discussion. Um, to draw on what both Ayanda and Neo said, I agree completely um, with what Sophia said in her interview that really stuck with me is that um, there's this trend of not necessarily a trend or just this um, sense that a lot of people um, across race groups have forgotten how many people um, fought for freedom for South Africa. It was not just black people. It was also colored people also joined the fight. There was a lot of white people that also joined the fight. A lot of Indian people, a lot of Asian people that also joined the fight. And it's not saying that um, we must now forget that, um, that black people um, helped to build this country. And what Sophia said is that um, you can never ask to be awarded. And yes, the awards are good, but it takes a country to build a country to create freedom for the country, to create a good country. Um, and that's what I really took from Sophia's um, points that it's not only about male or female or LGBTQIA community, it's about all races coming together to make sure that we're doing the right thing for the good of the people. It doesn't mean it must serve a certain kind of ethics, it must just be good for our country. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lydia. And I'm now going to ask our last two panelists just to contribute. So I'm going to first start with Mbali and then I'll ask Oliver to contribute. 
I mean, everything that's been said is clearly so applaudable. Um, but on Lydian's points, I think the the fact that we need to really recognize and acknowledge as a society that it's all of us versus the system. It's all of us versus a greater system that is institutionally and historically and time and time and again oppressed certain populations of people. And so when I was watching the interview on Dr. Tirok, what was so refreshing was seeing a white man who was cognizant of his privilege and the positionality that he had in society fighting against an apartheid system because he felt it instinctual. He was disgusted by what was happening and something that we really need to normalize. And this generation is 100% getting better at it, um, is, is really just fighting fights for all of us at large and not necessarily depending on the oppressed minority or in this case majority to fight the system because they're the ones being oppressed by the system. He himself was easily in a position of comfort and privilege and he could have, you know, sat and really waited out apartheid, um, as many people did. It, it, but he had an active decision to fight the system, um, which is which is huge. That was a significant takeaway take from me because I'd like to think that, at least as a servant leader, I would want to fight fights that aren't necessarily mine, while still not taking up space. Because I think like that's something that Ben. Um, that Dr. Turok had really done so incredibly was that he managed to fight a fight that wasn't necessarily his whilst not moving the mic from the people who needed it the most, because that can quite quickly also become a thing. Um, I think, of course, there are servant leaders with good intentions, but they are careerist, um, you know, tokens in play. They are people who have their own personal vendettas or, um, or ideals that they want to get out of fights and out of being politicized. Um, but he purely did it for the purpose, regardless of the fact that it, it really did affect him. It really did affect his family security, his own security, his safety. And that was something that he was willing to sacrifice for the greater good, because that's what true servant leaders do. Thank you so much, Mbali. I'm just going to ask um, Oliver to contribute and then I will open up to the panelists to make further contributions in relation to what has been said already. So Oliver, you can take it away, please. Thank you. Um, from what I learned from Ben Tirok is that he, he sees that public servants should always serve the interest of the majority and the people of South Africa in an ethical and unbiased way. And he has been, un and he has been serving ethically before the democracy of South Africa and after the democracy of South Africa. And he spoke about how the ANC forgot about the implementation of an economic um, growth for South Africa. And that was one of the key points that he highlighted, that we forgot to focus on economic growth. We focused on welfare of South Africa, which is good. But I believe that we are still, still we are young, a young democracy. And now I think we should start focusing on economic growth. Um, he also spoke his mind very often, which I think is a good quality of a servant leader. Um, when he was at the Congress of the People, he did not agree with the economics clause of the Freedom Charter. And that is why he changed it. He believed that the ownership should be returned to the people. And many people don't see it as that way. They, they see it as nationalization. But he spoke his mind then and also in 2011 when he disagreed to vote on the secrecy ball. So that is what I believe is a good quality of a servant leader speaking your mind, no matter in your circumstance, whether it be during apartheid or after apartheid. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Neo, I know you want to contribute um, to those last points. So I'm gonna give the floor to you now. 
Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add um, a bit on what Mbali was saying. I thought it was very interesting. Um, looking at Geraldine Fraser Moliketi's life story and how she was put in a maximum security prison for um, being accused for assassinating Job Kabi, um, who was a member of the ANC. And whilst being in that maximum security prison, she was I think she was 21 years old. She was very young during her second year at university. And um, her, her determination to just not give the police what they were asking for at that time was incredible to see because so many people, when it's not your fight, you feel like you can sit back. And um, at the time she was imprisoned, they were telling her that the ANC had no... Um, no note of her, they didn't know who she was. And later on, she was then visited by three senior members in the ANC. Um, and even whilst being visited, she she didn't discuss anything. She, she told um, the members that she wasn't going to speak on Comrade Mfishane. She just wasn't willing to give up what they were trying to strip out of her. And I think, as young people, if we can kind of take from that loyalty and take from that determination, it will take us so far because it's not an easy thing to do. Um, when you feel like you are alone, you're having to suffer, you're being imprisoned for someone else's accusations or, or whatever, and to still stick by your fight is quite admirable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naya, for that. Thank you everyone for your contributions. Um, I hope this gets everyone excited to sort of watch the interviews with a notepad and a pen and jot down some of the really insightful things that get spoken about. Um, we now that um, getting towards um, more the deeper end of the agenda points and it is Freedom Day, we did want to touch back on, you know, the elections that are coming up towards the end of the year and how these interviews sort of acted as a reflective tool for you all. So now I'm going to pose the question to you all as to what kind of sort of leadership attributes are you looking for now based on what you've watched, based on your life experience so far? I mean, you're going to be voting for the first time and that's a really momentous occasion in your life, I think. So what are the kinds of things that you think you're looking for and um, how best do you feel like you can identify those things in a leader? Um, I'm going to start this question off with Ayanda, if you could please let us know what your thoughts are. Okay, um, I think for me, the most important thing, and it's Freedom Day, so it's a good time to talk about this, is I feel like we can't talk about freedom without talking about economic freedom. And whenever elections come around, and now that I actually can vote, one thing that I look for in my leader is someone who is dedicated to dismantling economic oppression and the economic legacies of apartheid. That is something that I really want to see in my lifetime and in the coming years, hopefully in the next 10 years, if we can make that happen. And I want to see a leader who is fully passionate about that, who is fully willing to do anything to actualize that goal, who is willing to step on toes if he or she has to, who is willing to speak up against the organization he or she is in, if they are not on par with that goal, basically willing to step on toes to do anything they can to actualize that goal. So I think that's one thing I definitely will be looking for. Um, and it would be even better if there was an organization dedicated to that and one that demonstrated that they could do that effectively, honestly, and um, without any personal interest intervening as well. So I think that would be it for me. Great, thank you so much, Ayanda. I'll ask Lydia now to please um, contribute her thoughts on that question. I agree completely with Ayanda. Um, I think the trend has now become throughout, like when we, as young people, when we look at our government, when we look at the political leaders, um, a lot of it is mirroring um, personal goals and their own, what they want out of, um, what they would get out of, out of being in a position of power. 
Um, and so drawing on Sophia, I think it's very important that we look for people, look for leaders. What I will certainly be looking for is for a leader or a party that does not um, care about sweeping things under the rug so that we can make everything look perfect. Democracy is not about perfection. It's about harmony. It's about equality. That's what democracy is about. So I'll be looking for that. I'll look, be looking for um, a leader that is truly passionate and leads with compassion. Again, drawing on what um, Sophia said that, and the way that we can see if someone's being sincere um, and being truly and genuinely compassionate is to seeing that they're not just doing it for the fashion, as in they're not just caring about women rights or about um, gender-based gender -based violence because of because it's something that you need to do as a political leader in order to get the votes that you want, or um, supporting um, 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 sorry <laughs> economic equality and economic freedom just in order to get votes. I'm be looking for people that genuinely believe that this is what we need in a country in order to create a democratic state that we need in this country. Um, yeah, that's what I'll be looking for. Thank you so much, Jolene. I'm just going to ask Mbali to jump in there and let us know her thoughts. Uh, thanks, Lydia. And those points were so valid. Um, but bringing back to what Ayanda contributed, I think that there is a huge misconception that like as a generation, um, besides us being sensitive um, or um, like ultra compassionate about issues, I think people forget that there's, there isn't like a communal um, enemy. There isn't one big fight that we're all trying to fight. Um, as someone who'll be voting in the next election, I'm looking for someone that will address the political, environmental, economic, social issues of our state, right? Because all of them affect each other. I think the economic is a significant priority and something that does need to be um, discussed as well as really just put on a pedestal. Because if you think about the apartheid era, the fight was the racism. Like there was one fight and it was the racism. and. I mean, in the post-apartheid era, while well, you'd like to think that the racism might be gone, it is the underlying issue and the fuel of like every form of oppression that we have in South Africa. And so you need to acknowledge that racism aspect, even now in post-apartheid, because it still has its legacies that play out in our day to day. I mean, all of us have either experienced it, faced it, or had to witness it for ourselves. And that's just really, to think about considering we would consider ourselves like what 30 years out of democracy or at least almost 30 years in terms of the servant leader that i'll be voting for somebody who preferably um actually prioritizes transparency and accountability because as lydian said we're not looking for a perfect democracy because democracies are not perfection um you can only hope and vote that the person that you get is best suited to the things that you yourself prioritize, the things that are important to you. So read up on the testimonies and, you know, really invest yourself, do your research to try and get the leader for the South Africa that it is that you want. I think us voting in the shadows of our parents, those days are gone. Like we are all individuals. We all have agencies. We all have the ability to vote for, look out for, and actually put forward the types of leaders that we want to see, because we're the ones that are gonna to have to face the repercussions. We are the ones that need to live in the society. I mean, we're already trying to fix every environmental, gender-based, violent, um, technological and economic issue that generations before us have left us to deal with. So we can only make the cognizant effort and actual um, decision to really make something out of our state. Thank you so much, Mbari, for such an insightful contribution. 
Uh, before we continue with this discussion point, I do want to remind everyone who's in the attendee list that you can post your questions in the chat and we will um, make an effort to answer them as best as we can um, towards the end of this discussion. So please feel free to um, post any of the questions that you have in the chat box. I'm now going to ask um, Neo to please uh, make a contribution to the question that was posed. Um, in terms of the type of leader that I would be looking for, I think an interesting thing to look at is sustainable development goals. And I feel like so much in the past, um, a temporary solution has been placed on such uh, problems that hold longevity, that hold weight, that are still affecting us right now. And going forward, I feel like as young people, we need to really look at problems, look at solutions that are going to take us further than the right here and right now. Um, and I think a large part of looking at what we need to tackle with first is essentially breaking down the patriarchy. I think there are a lot of issues that plague our society currently. But I think really incorporating a woman's voice into high positions of decision making, high positions of um, justice, social justice is really, really crucial. And I feel like we might be masking ourselves a bit to say that we do have a woman's voice coming through, but I, I just I don't think it's enough. Um, I think merit also comes into it and a lot of the time I feel like a male um, counterparts who are in decision making positions often think that women don't have historically have the knowledge to take on these positions and don't actually have the ground to um to lead us and I feel like if we applied that same argument to the black and white fight saying black people shouldn't have high positions because historically we do not have this that and the other in um in terms of knowledge in order to make decisions and acknowledging the fact that women will make mistakes and will um be learning along the way is an important thing to acknowledge i just think in, instead of just expecting women to now have a perfect form or a perfect mold of how to be a leader and how to do this that it doesn't it shouldn't invalidate the fact that they are just as capable of leading our society um as other men or anyone and then along with what um ayanda and Mbali have stated i think economic issues social um, issues of homophobia, racism, I feel like you cannot be, call yourself an activist and just direct your activism in one um, sector of society. It, that is just false activism. So I feel like we really need that um, passion, that fire to be lit with young people to know that if you're going to stand for this one issue, you stand for all. That's, that's what activism really means. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neo. I'm now going to ask Oliver to touch on the topic. So what I see for a leader to be is a leader who instills confidence and trust in the masses. You know? A leader should always be in that position because he or she wants to be there. They enjoy the job. You're not just doing it for the fame, for the money, for your ego, um, you're doing it because you enjoy it. You got your job because you worked for it. You've got the qualifications because you wanted to get the qualifications. Um, for a leader, I would like to see someone who has clear goals. I want to see how those goals are progressing and what are the accomplishments thus far. Um, yeah, that, that's it, thank you. That's it. Thank you so much, Oliver, for that contribution. I think we will echo that as well. I will now ask um, Puti to lay down a contribution um, for this question. So the ideal leader that I'd like to work for at the upcoming elections in October is basically a leader whose aim is above their own self-interest, but to uphold the deeds and the interests of the people of South Africa listen to the people and their interests and fulfill their demands and needs. Not to just serve your soul or individual interest, but the interest of the public. 
Um, I need a leader who is compassionate and is peaceful, drawing from what Sophia said, uh, for a person of servitude. I need a fearless leader who believes in safety in numbers, who fights for the struggles of women within the government and society throughout our country, who, uh, who assists gender commissions in the rural areas, who is aware of the inclusion that the community should be recognized and honored rather than the individuals who are in the position of power. Stop sweeping things under the carpet, just say it like it is, because we're not in a democratic state that is perfect, like Lydia and Bali stated. Um, I, need a, I need a new leadership that's broad and inclusive and doesn't have to be solely ANC or any other political party that's already populated, but it could be anyone who has the value and set of minds. I need the right frame of values and minds to serve South Africa, have integrity, honor, and resilience who knows his or her work, who has the skills of analyzing documents, who is aware and informed of all the constitutions of South Africa, who is just not a leader who's put in the position of power, but does not know their work. They need to know the ins and outs of the complex issue of South Africa's history to form an ideal future for our country. Um, I need the kind of person who doesn't go to a place and says, this is my place. You're a fleeting body in this experience of time. You are the, you there to serve. The people around you, they don't work for you, they work with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruti. I think what really stood up, I want to say the people around you work with you, not for you. Um, thank you, I think that's really insightful. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to take one of the questions that have been posed to the panelists. Um, so the question that the first question that we're going to address and anyone who wants to volunteer to take this up first you're more than welcome to is have you found a political party or political leader that have the qualities that you spoke about and this question was presented by Marie Louise Samuels. Um, is there anyone who has found a glorious leader. I'll answer. Um, no, I have not. Um, I'm still researching to find a leader that does represent all of these qualities, but I strongly believe that a new leader is created or founded every single day. Um, a leader that's in our age group or a leader that is older than us that has these qualities and never saw themselves as a leader before, but did things, as I said before, continuously with genuine compassion because they care. Um, and they only found themselves being a leader later on in their lives or only after watching this panel discussion or watching the interviews on servant leader, um, that they are an, in fact a leader and a leader that we deserve as a country. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much Lillian, for that contribution. Um, we do have until October to figure that out. So thank you for that question. Um, the next question was presented by Nikki Roberts. It says, um, I hear descriptions of individuals and leaders, but very little about the collective. It makes me wonder about our proportional representation system and the new process for independence being able to stand for elections. So panelists, would you prefer to be voting for an individual or a party and why? I think I'll start us off because I do have an answer to that. I would very much prefer to be voting for whomever I feel like best represents my interests. So if the party is the one that has presented a united front that works in relation with my own interests and needs that I see, then I'd vote for the party. But if I see there's an individual that if they were in that space where that party is, they'd be able to keep that party accountable. I think it's, you know, being able to do both of those things is something that's really important. And our democracy, because it is representational, every single voice that does get a seat, whether it's 50 of the seats or only two of the seats, all of those voices are important in terms of making sure that people stay accountable. So I think when it comes to um, if an individual shows promise, then 1000% I'd vote for them, but they need to be an individual that is strong enough to take up the bigger collective sort of party um, 
powers that are at play because those are very significant in our country, whether it's the opposition party or the main ruling party, those are very big sort of power dynamics that are at play. So whoever becomes an individual I'd like to stand for needs to be someone that has the, a significant amount of independence and also is willing to fight that fight because it's easy yeah, to sort of try and appease to one of those, you know, power heads to gain more power, but to be someone who will sort of stand steadfast in their independence is really important. I'm going to ask Lydian if she would be willing to contribute to this question, please. Um, I agree with Danal. I think that's the beauty of our South African democracy and our, our, our parliament is that we're not voting for an individual, we're also voting for a party because like I said before, it takes a country to change a country. Um, and so like Danal said, it takes an individual um, that's just one leader that could hold a party or a group of people who's in a position of power to hold their people accountable that they work with that are in their parties most important as well as um, other political leaders in other parties and then also um, yeah in yeah I think that's just the general beauty of our government and our parliament is that we're not just voting for an individual we're not just voting for a party we're voting for both we're voting for uh, yeah <laughs> and uh, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lydia. And I'm now going to ask Mbali if she'd be willing to touch onto that question for us. And also, if there's anything that you think the question touches on that you'd like to address, please, to all the panelists, feel free to contribute. I think I would prefer to vote for a party. I think it's because, as you said, in a proportional um, parliament system that we have in South Africa, in this democracy, people get seats. Um, so I could obviously vote for an individual and, you know, hope for the best, but at least if I vote for um, a collective or a party at large, I know that there are people that I should be able to rely on to hold other people accountable. Um, I know this goes back to the interview, but something that uh, Professor Turok had done, I think so effortlessly and, and mind you, without caution or even um, hesitation was hold the people in the ANC accountable. He was the first one to criticize the president. He was the first one to criticize the party that was at the helm of the country um, for making certain promises to the people and completely sidetracking from those promises, from, from completely deviating from the things that it is that you said that you were going to accomplish and how you were gonna prioritize your people. And they didn't do that. And if we voted for individuals and not parties, I don't think we would hear those voices of criticism, or at least even if we did, we know that they wouldn't carry water. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have power. Um, I think, I just, I, I feel like the, the individual, I think voting for individuals can be so flawed to an extent because you cannot put all your eggs in one basket for one person. We can't just cross fingers, hope for the best that the single individual will run our country with all of the right intentions and won't mess up and won't take accountability. If they have people in their party checking them, if we vote for a party at large, then at least we can put our hope in, um, in more than one person. I just don't think it's, it's completely feasible to rely on a person completely because, I mean, a, a, a single individual cannot run a state. If anything, we need to mobilize as a democracy, as a community, as a society to try and get us where we want to be. And it just, I mean, Ubuntu, like I just, I don't, I don't really, I can only see the correlation between wanting to be with people for other people and not one person for a whole country. I just don't think it's, I think it's, I think it's highly flawed, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Mbali, for that contribution. I know Neo wanted to also touch on this question. So um, once Neo has given their contribution, we'll move on to one more question um, that I will present to the panelists. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say it's um, struck my attention recently, just this notion of power and um, the difference between power and authority. And I think what's been revealed to me quite clearly is that 
power so often is just a perception and is not really as tangible as we make it seem. And if we could just kind of unveil this idea of what is power and who has power, um, it would really take the pressure off of us as human beings and as leaders to kind of step in and lead perfectly or just kind of make decisions um, with the people we are leading's best interests at heart. So I think I personally would also vote for a party because in a group of people like that, you'll have faults. Um, and it kind of dismantles this idea of one person being able to have power, which essentially isn't really something that you could hold or that you could see. And um, giving that authority to a bigger group of people allows people to um, hold others accountable, allows a group of people to build integrity and that integrity can lead to trust. And us as voters can then place that trust in the fact that that group of people there might be some who have let you down but there are others that have integrity and I just feel like the trust the the basis of the trust is deeper rooted um when it's a larger group of people um opposed to just one individual who is bound to let you down who is bound to mess up somewhere and then that pressure turns into you kind of villainize that one person not realizing that a group of people you will get the same thing, but at least your chances are better of having someone you can place your integrity in. So that's my answer. Thank you so much for that contribution there. We do have another question that has been posted by um, an individual named Beware. Beware asked the question, do you think it's time to change our economic ideology to a liberal state? Who in the current leadership do you see leading us to this ideology? So I, I think sort of as a response, I think that's quite a, a um, I, I don't know how, like quite a big question, I think. Um, and just sort of to get the ball rolling, I do think that um, a, a big parts of our constitutional democracy are actually quite inspired from a liberal system. So we have a separation of powers, we have a checks and balances system, um, perhaps um, in terms of economic ideology, I don't know if you want to follow up on that question as well, but I think what would be a better question is probably what do you see as an ideal economic situation in our country, if anyone wants to touch on that um, as a question. Because I do think that question is quite, um, in depth in that sense. Um, it may not be um, something that anyone would like to approach. So if there's anyone who wants to touch on that question. Can I give it a shot? <laughs> sure, thank you. <laughs> um, I think in terms of an economic ideology that I I personally would um, find like preferable for South Africa would be that of a socialist state. But I think people forget that countries that have, um, that have executed socialism so well and so seamlessly had a cumulative wealth to begin with. So if you're gonna look at a Scandinavian country like Switzerland or Denmark that runs themselves as a socialist state, that is because they had the money to do so. Um, South Africa has so much catching up to do and it's by no fault of our own, like not even remotely. Um, but the only thing that's gonna get us there is economic equity. And so the positionality of people's jobs and the distribution of work and labor and land is the only thing that's gonna really get everybody on an equal footing in terms of economic wealth so that we can actually look at those kinds of aspirations. Because as um, Neo said, I think in a previous question, that these like temporary fixes um, for these issues that do have longevity just aren't sustainable. Um, and you can look at it something like uh, RDP, right? When that was introduced as a program, it was about the 
distribution as well as the development of wealth to try and get South Africa in the position that they have to be um, through uplifting those who were oppressed significantly by the apartheid era. And it's fallen through because the economic side has not been prioritized to the extent that it should be because we were so focused on okay racism let's just fix racism not that that can be fixed you know with the wave of a magic wand that those are the places that lack those are the ones that are being neglected and so while a socialist regime I would say would be ideal in the South Africa that I would like to see I know that that's going to take years if not decades because we're not at the same position as the rest of the world. Because I mean, they managed to take all of our resources, accumulate all of that wealth, and then still turn around and be like, you guys need to play catch up. So pointing fingers at us for our economic recession, or the fact that our economy isn't where it should be, we're not starting where everyone else is. I mean, we're, as far as I'm concerned, we're practically a premature country. I mean, we're 30 years into a democracy that's, it, it's, it's unfounded upon. Um, I know that the socialist route can be deemed radical and I'm completely open to that discussion as well as that criticism, but it is something that I would personally like to see in my country. So thank you, Mbali, for your contribution. I think now rereading the question, I understand what was posed. I think I answered it incorrectly initially, um, but sort of just to retouch on it, I guess, I, I uh, sort of appreciate the idea of a mixed economy specifically. So I do understand sort of the importance of like private equity and having a strong sort of open market where people are able to compete. But I do think it's necessary to have safeguards. So in South Africa, we have competition law and it's a really important component in terms of regulating all these massive companies that we have and massive conglomerates. So for example, if you look at our grocery industry, you can name the five stores that you will find everywhere. And that's something that can concern you. The fact that it, the South African brewery has sort of control of about 90% of the, the alcohol distribution market is something also that gets regulated. So I think a bit of both is always important. I don't think uh, systems that act in absolutes um, are able to address their cons so that's why it's important that you have a mixed system so that the, the weaknesses of a select system can be addressed um, through some of the strengths of another system. So I think that's kind of my take on it. I don't know if anyone else wanted um, to speak specifically on this and just basically um, what anything about our economic state, um, if anyone wants to touch on that. If not, um, I do have a final question for the panel. Um, what I do want to ask is, what will you all be doing today, this Freedom Day? Uh, I'll ask Ayanda first. <laughs> Let us know what you will be doing today on Freedom Day. I really didn't have any plans for Freedom Day. I mean, this was what I was planning to do on Freedom Day. Um, and afterwards, I am shooting a video for someone um, for an ANC branch that I'm part of. And other than that, I don't have any plans for Freedom Day. Thanks so much, Ayanda. Um, Lydian, you want to touch on what you'll be doing today on Freedom Day? Um, I have nothing planned. Like Ayanda said, this is my plan for Freedom Day. Um, I think it's after you posing that question, I think it's quite interesting how um, with a lot of the public holidays, how is there's nothing that's planned except on Mandela's birthday where there's 60 minutes that everybody has something planned for that day. But then for the rest of the public holidays, um, yes, you see on the TV, the news has something planned for this day. Um, but we as people of South Africa, there's not necessarily something that we have planned for our public holidays that are not public holidays just because they're public holidays, like monumental things happened on these days. And whew, I'm gonna have to think about what I'm doing for the rest of the day now. Thank you, Lydia and Mbali. Um, well, I, I'm with them. I did not plan anything for today. Um, this was my plan for Freedom Day, but I think I have to say like, 
it was a really productive way of spending it. I don't think I would have spent this much time thinking about what this day means um, or even doing the research that so many people should about South Africa and just like a really rich history. I mean, I, I think if anything, it was an educational way to celebrate the day. And I'd hope that other people after watching this will, you know, watch the interviews and check out Daniel's stories. Um, but I know for me personally, I will be studying for my law test that is tomorrow because the University of Cape Town does not rest and they do not let us rest. So that is what I'll be doing for the rest of the day. Thank you, Mbali. Um, now, if you will let us know what you'll be doing today, that would be great. Um, so when you asked us that question, the first thought that popped into my mind was the saying that Rome wasn't built in a day, <laughs> you know that. Um, but I think what I will be doing um, is really just uh, promoting this, this platform, sharing um, this servant leadership program on my personal social media accounts. Um, I agree with Mbali so much. I definitely don't think I would have been this invested um, if not for this program on this particular day. So I think I wanna give to other people what um, this discussion has given me and allow them to know how impactful these videos really are. Um, and just encourage people to know how important it is um, as a young person to be passionate about leadership and to be passionate about voting because uh, very soon this is our future that is going to be um, played out in front of us. So yeah, really just wanting to share this platform and encourage other people to, to read upon what we've just been discussing now. Thank you so much, Nia. Um, Oliver? So I'll basically be studying also for tests this week and completing assignments. Um, and yeah, this was basically my plan for the day to attend a session, a debate, and prioritize the adver advertising of this platform. That's it, thank you. Thanks, Oliver Puti. My plan for the day was to participate in this very informative um, discussion. And then after that, take part in rehearsals for a production throughout the whole day. I really didn't plan anything outside of the academic spectrum, but I encourage other people, the panelists and the other viewers to just take maybe a maximum hour to just go through the website of Servant Leaders leaders and just be conscientized about like voting and the importance of it but other than that i'll just be doing academic work out of my hands thank you so much Puti. i do see that we have one more question so i think the question is actually a good way to sort of end up this discussion um the question was uh, posted by renee ward it asks the qualities of a true leader are an ideal and a complex state that requires cohesion of personal value standards, norms, self-awareness and education and growth, et cetera. Um, essentially requires people to raise people to this ideal. How can this be achieved in practical leadership terms? Wow, what a question. Um, so I think, uh, again, I just sort of, all the things that we touched on, right? Um, confidence, compassion, ethical leadership, speaking truth to power, prioritizing the national interest, all those values just come in. And when you're considering to make a decision, you patch in on that and then you use those principles that you have to carry you forward. Um, Neo, if you wanna sort of close us off in terms of a contribution and then we can say goodbye to everyone. Um, I just have a quick comment on this question. I think uh, what's really important is that we've been speaking so much about holding our leaders accountable. And I think it really starts with holding each other accountable as well. Um, I think that's where I've personally seen the most uh, progression is when we hold each other accountable, even for the smallest and slightest comments about um, things that you just know aren't okay and aren't progressive to the South Africa that we are trying to build. So I think holding your peers and your family members accountable for what they say and how they act is important. 
Okay, great. Thank you all so much for being here today and having this discussion with us. And thank you to all our attendees on Zoom and on Facebook Live for watching this um, discussion today. I hope that it was insightful and I hope it inspires you all to take a look at the episodes and also to um, reflect on where we are in terms of leadership and the elections ahead. So if you'd like to watch the episodes, you can go to servantleader.co.za and that will lead you to all our social media pages, also lead us you to, sorry, um, to our YouTube where you can watch the episodes, leave your comments on the videos, share, like every sort of click that is made to the page is deeply appreciated and it just affirms all the hard work that went into creating the content. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you to all our panelists and I hope you have a fantastic Freedom Day. Bye. Thanks, bye. Thank you.